Good evening and welcome to the Ju July 9th, 2024 regular board meeting. Uh, I'll call this meeting to order. Please rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Director Bocanegra has our land acknowledgement. Thank you. Evergreen Public Schools resides on the traditional lands of the Chinook and peoples and the Cowlitz tribe. They have lived on and cared for this land and its waterways since time immemorial. We thank them for their stewardship and make this acknowledgement to open a space of recognition, inclusion, and respect for all indigenous students, families, and staff in our community. Thank you, Julie. The next item is to adopt the agenda for tonight. I move to adopt tonight's agenda as presented. Second. So moved and seconded. Uh, Director Bogdanogra, Director Weatherspoon. Bronwald. Bronwald. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have adopted the agenda for tonight. So the first item on our agenda for this meeting is public comments community members who wish to speak to the board. Uh, each speaker has a maximum of three minutes. There's no mechanism whereby a speaker can donate some or all of their time to another speaker. No individual may speak more than once per regular meeting, even if there's time remaining. And please state your name and district affiliation, if any. Um, I'll note as well that uh, we have a public hearing item uh, coming up after public comments, so if you have um, some comments or input on the sale of the old image elementary school property i'd ask that you uh, reserve your comments to that point in the agenda the first person on our list here is corey ward coming in from uh, online I'll make sure to get back to that. Okay. Corey Ward, are you here? Corey, can you hear us? I'm here. Hi, Corey, welcome. Hi. Sorry, I'm currently driving home for my honeymoon, so my apology. Congratulations. We're ready when you are. Okay, I don't know if you can see me. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, all right, so uh, my name is Corey Ward, now Corey Young. I have five children in the school district. My youngest will be class of 2037. I volunteer regularly my kids at school, so I'm around quite a bit. I have children that have IEPs and also who work with academic interventionists. I first want to say welcome to our interim superintendent, Christine Maloney. I'm sorry I cannot meet you tonight in person. And I actually would like to use her three R's to help convey my hope and concerns for the coming year. And I wanted to state that this snapshot as she comes in, there are so many experiences and interactions that have led to the statements I'm going to share. Relationships. People don't know how much you don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Unfortunately, the treatment of most of the parents and students have received from the board, from the board's actions, is one of not caring, of actions and words not aligning, of claiming a desire for collaboration without any action to make it happen. This lack of communication makes it impossible to build a relationship. Also on relationships, there's currently little, if any, trust with the community and its board. The majority of the board has flat out ignored the community members they represent and voted accordingly. Once again, not allowing their words and actions of representing us to match. Rigorous, making sure we have the scaffolding for the students to succeed. This is a tough one where the majority of the board approved a budget that cut elementary librarians and parents and then went on to say how incredible these positions they just approved cutting are. Part of the plan to cover for the work of librarians is to have the academic interventionists at the elementary level do some of the now media specialist work. 
the board seems totally fine taking my dyslexic child to an eventless time to cover for the loss of librarians, taking their scaffolding because, well, it doesn't affect their children, or taking my children's paras, preventing them from receiving their full IEP minutes, all at the elementary level, where if that scaffolding fails, what hope do they have for middle school and high school, which re leads right into relevance to our children's futures. So at elementary levels, we have the loss of paras. IEP meeting minutes not being fulfilled, loss of librarians, and the academic effect that will have. Middle school and high schools where security is nowhere near adequate for the amount of students we have, where there's more security for the district office than any of our middle schools or high schools, make that make sense. Students are allowed disrespectful behaviors towards their teachers, and teachers are not allowed to speak out. They're expected to just fix it, to keep putting on multiple hats, but yet at the district office, more and more director positions are being created rather than be them being told to put on multiple hats. Make that make sense, please. How does any of this lead to positivity for our students' futures? How are we setting them up for the future where, unless you are a top succeeding student, your needs and safeties go unmet? The lay of the land. There's not currently trust between the community and the school board or district office. Our teachers union has currently given the district a vote of no confidence. And on average, we are one of the poorer districts with the most lucrative administrative jobs and pay. Make it make sense, please. I wish Superintendent Maloney luck and truly hope to see her words and actions align as she leads our district. Our district is not a private corporation and stakeholders deserve accurate information, transparency, and accountability on how our money is being spent and decisions made by the administration. I hope our new superintendent feels the same way and that this year we can start to turn things around by working together and demanding better from those who keep making those same decisions that do not help our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Next person on the list is Catherine Furtick. Catherine, welcome. Good evening. My name is Catherine Furtick. I have three graduates from EPS and a current student. It is crucial to collaborate with this community, your community so we can advocate more effectively for, with our legislature for adequate funding for our schools. We are heading into election season again, and while there are many issues within our district's leadership needing attention, we recognize that there's a huge disparity between what our state provides and what our students desperately need, needs which have grown exponentially since 2020. We can be your greatest asset for positive change if you allow us to be. We are eager to see this change come to fruition by working with you and our new superintendent, Welcome. Talk about hitting the ground running. I want to again encourage our leadership to visit the classrooms and see the teaching and learning conditions of our schools. We have so many great staff and students, but the reality of the struggles they face daily needs to be seen and acknowledged. As I sat in on an SIP meeting of several principals discussing their school's year-end progress reports, a board member acknowledged how much gets handed to our school staff and leadership that they are expected to just manage despite how challenging. I appreciated this candor. Collaboration in this aspect also, I believe would be beneficial to everyone. I would love to see more of a let's figure out how to manage this together approach rather than what often appears as you're on your own, good luck, Godspeed, and by the way, you need to increase your numbers. Speaking of you're on your own, we'd like to ask what progress leadership has made towards mitigating our elementary librarian loss. Teacher planning time is one of the many fallouts from these cuts. We need a plan that preserves academic consistency for students district-wide, not just a school-by-school -school approach. It is crucial to provide educational equity, which already took a hit with the loss of teacher librarians. We last heard of Paris mentioned as a stopgap, also hints of interventionists and such. These are all support staff. We are already in dangerously short supply of a consistent and adequate number of paras. How will we potentially hire more if we're already struggling to hire enough now? How are the ones we have now already spread so thin going to manage additional responsibilities, not to mention the effect on the children who are struggling to have their IEP and 504 plan minutes fulfilled? We certainly consider our support staff to be vital for student success. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from Dr. Maloney on this in the months to come. There will also be additional challenges with pursuing another levy. There is already a deep distrust and loss of faith in leadership, collaboration with your community, transparency from start to finish, accurate information about how voters' money is spent, and accountability for your decisions as leadership will be integral in the success of voters placing trust back in you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. 
Next speaker is Camille Lohman. Camille. Hi, my name is Camille. I'm a mother of a soon-to-be first grader. I'm also a co-founder of a nonprofit that fiercely advocates for K-12 communities in various ways, but began by empowering individual voices of a community to unite together for what's in the best interest of students. In the last several years, there have been resignations and exits by staff and elected officials, some being secret keepers and some because they did not feel comfortable operating within an organization with so many secrets anymore. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies that serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments that they have created. This is found several times in RCW Chapter 42 related to uh, the Open Public Meeting Act in 4230010 and also public records requests, 42.50.030. Legislative findings in 2014 concluded that the rights of the citizens to observe the actions of their public officials <coughs> and to have timely access to public records are the underpinnings of democracy and essential for meaningful citizen participation. The legislature also found that implementing improvements in public service will will in turn enhance public trust and result in significant cost savings. Knowledge is power, and when information is withheld or manipulated, or when there is a lack of accessible information, it naturally leads to assumptions being made to fill in all the gaps, some being rumors and some not. But it fosters an environment where confusion, skepticism, fear, and mistrust flourishes, but like a weed to the point where even when business is conducted properly and is in accordance with all the acts, laws, RCWs, there is still looming suspicion. And even when honest makes, uh, mistakes occur due to human error, there is little room for grace or understanding, which is valid due to the extensive history of secrecy. And it still feels like public comment section of board meetings is just screaming into the void without an echo back, even within three to five business days. Voices that insist on remaining informed are not the enemy. There is significant value in admitting when you don't have all the answers and communicating expectations in order to cut off the food supply to the weed of mistrust so that something healthy rather than destructive has a chance to grow. But it takes more than killing a weed for growth to occur. We need soil, water, but we especially need sunshine, the law to shine light to ensure accountability and promote transparency, effectively decreasing confusion and fear and growing trust. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> Angie Bunda. Hi. Welcome. Hi, guys. I'm going to take a breath. I rushed over here. Uh, you all know me, uh, except for Dr. Maloney. I'm, my name is Angie Bunda. I have two kids in the district. This is my first year in the district, and I'm excited for what we have in store. Um, uh, I felt compelled to talk today just because there's so many different things that need to be brought up, but I didn't really have a plan. So please forgive me for not being very organized. However, um, I was really impressed when I went to the principal SIP, SILP, the meeting to listen to the principals talk about their school year, talk about what went wrong, what didn't go well, what did go well. It was really encouraging to see the passion and dedication that they have towards their schools and their children. And one thing that was mentioned was the strategic plan and how we had worked really hard this year on implementing the first two parts of the strategic plan, teaching and learning and school environment, and we had seen benefits from that. And that um, we are now hoping as a community that we can start implementing the second parts of the strategic plan, family and community and employee engagement. And I'm not just saying make it happen or else I'll yell at you. I have ideas, yeah. So as far as ideas, 
with family and community, we're still asking for the same things. We're still hoping for the same things. We would love to see similar things to what Dr. Armstrong implemented at PPS with her PACE program that has different forums for um, policies, for, for SPED, for all sorts of different things where the board and the community can engage together. You can, you can pass ideas to each other. And there's open communications, uh, as well as having a suggestion that I gave you guys for maybe doing a workshop after your meetings that could include like a town hall, where it's like a you're already gathered. You don't have to have another meeting. You don't have to pay for another thing, uh, where you can talk to the community afterwards. And I think people would really appreciate the opportunity, and I think that they would really surprise you um, just with the option of being able to speak to someone. Uh, as far as employee engagement, I will send you all an email since I'm running out of time, but I feel that it says we will encourage all of our staff to share their opinions, experiences, and expertise to inform any decision that impacts them and their students. When I read this, it hit me like a ton of bricks that this is literally the opposite of our staff expression policy, 5254, which states any anything that an employee says inside or outside of work that could be uh, constructed as negative or have an adverse uh, adverse impact on so district operations may result in disciplinary disciplinary action, including termination. So you're telling people that your pillar foundation that you believe in upmost is to allow them to speak, but this policy says anything that they say that the district decides is negative, they could be fired. We need to talk more about that, and I'm happy to do that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Well, Cronenbush. Cronenbush? <clears throat> yeah, either way. <laughs> if we're not sure anyways, the family doesn't know. <clears throat> Bill Cronenbush, uh, stakeholder here in uh, Orchard Sifton and uh, grandfather of a couple of children here in, in the district. Um, basically, I have three items this evening, just real simple. The first is I, I realized that we've spoken, uh, the board has talked a lot about, or people have come up and talked about a cell phone policy. Um, a no cell phone policy, and I think it's a win. I think it's a win-win simple situation. I know, you know, it might take a little bit of time to implement it, to, but the, the policy that, that some teachers came up, and I believe it was from Evergreen and, and spoke of, it was a wonderful policy. It sounded really well. I think you could implement it, do it. Um, it'd be a great win before the start of school, set up for what, what we really need. We need to help the teachers. If the teacher's asking for that help, Let's do it. It's not a money issue. It's just a simple policy change. Talk about it, implement it. We could do this over the summer and, and let's go forward and help the kids. Let's take the distractions away. I think everybody wants that, parents and also the teachers. The second item uh, I wanted to talk about was the youth truth. Uh, you just heard a couple uh, statements about it. It's $68,000. We are talking two paras or most of a librarian that, that we just got done laying off. This is not the time, this is inappropriate. This is, this, is, this is irresponsible of the board to, I know it's coming up on the consent agenda, to uh, allow that, that expense. That we have, there's a cost benefit here that is just not, that cost benefit, just to, you need to talk about that, that before you need to be transparent to about the community about what Youth Truth is all about. A lot of the, youth, the community and the parents do not understand that there are a gender identity questions on, on the survey. They don't, many of them don't even know their children are being asked this question. The, again, here's the, pol the transparency piece that so many parents and, 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 and teachers have been talking about it. No transparency about what's going on. Um, the third thing is, is, is uh, again, a, a budgetary thing. Uh, the EV buses, um, really it's too long range. I mean, this is, this is a wish. I, I, I know it's not our job really to, to change the climate. Our job and our focus and our priority should be academics. Um, our OSPI numbers are in the tank. We don't have time to be worrying about that. That's a long range problem. We, gotta, we have to conserve our, our teachers and our resources and not worry and take, not take focus off the things that are really important and that's our kids. So I just want you all to consider that, especially the, the, uh, the uh, coming up here, the Youth Truth Survey piece, as it comes up, if it does, in the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for your comments. Okay, I'll uh, 
that's all the people who were on the list. I'll go ahead and close the public comment section. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a public hearing for the public to comment on the sale of the old Image Elementary School property. Are there any members of the uh, audience here or online who have a statement about uh, the decision to sell that property? Camille first. Hello. Uh, I just want to confirm and just clarify that the sale of old image, uh, the, the, the proceeds won't go to the general fund. It would go to the debt service fund. I know that there's a lot of confusion um, one way or the other. Um, and I think, I think the community would benefit from um, uh, just an explanation a little bit more about how that goes. So um, the conversation doesn't lead to like, um, uh, why aren't we using it to like bring back more teachers or paras? So that's all. Thank you. Phil, do you have a comment? Uh, was there a consideration uh, to what's going to happen if we need it back? I mean, we, we, it's, as, as the city grows, it, it's not going to be able to get this land back. I know it's not needed now, but going to the future, I hope there is some consideration. You know, if, if you know, I don't know if it's resold. Are we the do we are we going to have first rights to to buy it back if we need it the resource or maybe I'm confused with what could happen in the future because if the district's going to grow eventually we'll ne maybe need it back so I'd like to know what happens. Okay, thank you. Um, I think both of those questions are easily answered. Um, and uh, Superintendent Maloney, I ask that uh, your office reach out to both of those uh, individuals and. Uh, Supply them with an explanation. Um, it's it's a public hearing. <coughs> if that's all right. Okay. Yeah. We'll open a discussion on the matter now. Okay. Sorry. Um, just wanted to make a, just a few comments to Phil's, or uh, responses to Phil's comments. Um, a portion of the image property actually belongs to SEH. They were lending it to us. Um, that building itself was one of our first that we rebuilt because it's, the infrastructure is not good. Um, they actually have to shovel snow off this, the roof every year. Um, we actually have other properties around the city that don't have anything on them that we own, so there are other places that we could build, but to be able to make that property to a point that we could actually continue to use it, it would just cost us too much money. And it's always kind of been the plan with SEH on this property. Sorry, that's all I wanted to Thanks. say on that. Uh, with respect to the, uh, um, the disposition of the funds, from the sale of the property, my understanding is that it will be deposited into the Capital Improvements Fund. I'm seeing nods from the facilities and financial experts in the audience here, uh, and from the superintendent, uh, because the law states that um, those funds can only be used for buildings or other capital improvements. Um, it's a very common question that, uh, that people ask because <clears throat> of, of the misunderstanding uh, sometimes that Camille raised. Um, and we want to be clear about that, too, uh, that if we could, <laughs> I think we'd be uh, a little more creative about it. But it's, it's an unfortunate truth. Any other comments? No further action is required at this time. So I'll close the public hearing for public comment on the sale of Old Image Elementary School. And we'll move on to um, the next item on our agenda, the board consent agenda. I move to approve the board's consent agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded, Gronwald and Wilson. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Just waiting for the technical pieces. 
Uh, and the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's consent agenda. I ask that item F and K be removed from the consent agenda and open to discussion. Okay, we're removing items F. Oh, it's two-sided. Uh, the agreement between Evergreen Public Schools and Center for Effective Philanthropy and K, the Washington Interscholastic Activities Association schools approved for membership items, um, which we'll uh, dispose of after we vote on the remainder of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Um, perhaps you can make that motion, Gary. Yeah, I motion that we approve the um, superintendent consent agenda, excluding those two items at this point. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Wilson and um, Weatherspoon. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, with respect to item F, the agreement between Evergreen Public Schools and the Center for Effective Philanthropy, um, discussion and action will require a motion. I move for approval of item F. Um, oh. hmm? Second. Okay. Um, Moved and seconded to approve item F. Is there any discussion? Yeah, um, item F is a three-year contract for the Youth Choose Survey. <coughs> and in January, we um, had this past year's Youth Choose Survey. And we had parental and teacher concerns about four optional questions. And one question was asked of elementary school children. The uh, three questions were asked of middle school children. Um, I reviewed those questions at our April board workshop, and I asked who decides whether these optional questions are asked, and our then um, superintendent, John Boyd, said the district decides. And I didn't ask further about, you know, who within the district, and I probably should have at that time, but it appears maybe at the, is this the point in time since we're approving this, and it has... Um, like a cost for the basic survey, and then there's some additional components where I believe these additional questions are added in. So is, is this the point in time where we discuss those options, or is this... I know it's 68000 for the entire survey, and I believe those additional questions are, I think, at 4000 and it's an annual for the next three years. So, um, yeah, my... My concern about um, the four questions that were detailed in April um, that were, as I said, a parent and, and teacher concern. Um, one concern are children like my youngest daughter who is on the autism spectrum. And autism children are much more impressionable. And autistic children are, are a particularly vulnerable group when and at higher risk of social manipulation and they are also, autistic children are up to six times as likely to experience gender confusion. So I always wanna err on the side of caution when exposing children to concepts that may not be age appropriate based on their development of the child. And I don't think anyone can tell me that for all the children that are asked these questions of, that development, developmentally they are appropriate for all of them. And I know youth truths survey has in varying forms benefits and I don't have all the answers but I do have some concerns thank you, um, thank you. <laughs> I had to make sure the mic was on um, <clears throat> do you have a uh, experience with superintendent Maloney do you have experience with youth truth and now that's structured or is that a question that we could answer at a later time? Yeah, right now, um, I have not had experience with youth um, truth surveys. Um, I have uh, experience with the healthy youth survey mm -hmm. and um, the process to go through at the district level and uh, specific administrators to go through and decide based on um, you know, the community and what we need that data for. Um, was We were able to choose, pick and choose which questions we wanted. That was with healthy youth survey. Um, so I, I can't answer directly with True North or um, with you Truth at this point. Yeah. I can get you information though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So I just want to add a couple of things. So it, um, the additional topics are related to emotional and mental health, school safety, inclusion, et cetera, which we have used the survey as we've built in the strategic plan for the uh, sense of belonging and using it kind of as a, as a base point so we know where our kids and families are. We're also part of the survey is the family survey that goes out to um, all 39 schools, parents of all 39 schools. So it's a way for us to get the feedback that we're needing, that two-way communication from, from our families as well. And I think that the concern was around the very first question on the survey. Um, it was the question, are you boy, girl, or um, how do you, like, I can't remember the exact wording, but how do you identify? Um, and then the rest of the questions, I think, were pretty age appropriate. And really, a lot of it had to do with how they felt about math, too, and learning and academics. And then we added the um, student belonging questions around emotional and mental health, which I think are really important for us to continue to gauge. Plus, we've had some um, work with the Youth Truth um, folks that have actually come in and done some workshops with our kids, and I thought they did an outstanding job presenting to our kids and giving us some additional tools that we can use. So do we decide at this point whether those questions that were optional and um, not well received by everybody, um, were, are we approving those questions right now, or is this something that's approved? It's my understanding we're just approving the contract for the next three years to do it, but I know we can definitely look at the questions that are asked before those surveys are submitted. Because I know the Youth Truth worked with our student board reps to make sure they formulated the questions the way they thought were best. And are parents involved in that decision making? or On the questions that are yeah. asked? Yes. I don't remember. I know that the student board reps were, after the fact, they were working with Youth Truth. They were working with Youth Truth on uh, a mathematics section. Mm -hmm. The part um, where they came and did some workshops mm -hmm. with some of our classrooms. So that was their involvement. I don't have a sense right now that the student reps were involved in the demographic or, uh, yeah. or gender questions. Yeah. Um, but I agree that this approves the contract. And um, this is Center for Effective Philanthropy have been uh, pretty responsive uh, to the district's concerns. Um, and I think the conversation can continue with an approved contract. Yeah. Um, I'm especially interested to see if there's um, an, a well understood way to, if, if desired for a parent to opt their students out. I think there's um, a few percentages of folks who uh, might like to express that. And so, in my opinion. Uh, so th there's a need for a continued conversation. Yeah. And as, I understand it's, you know, a sensitive topic and it does have value in its varying forms uh, and yeah it's I don't again I don't have all the answers but um, if approving this is possibly approving those four questions down the road I'd probably then choose to abstain at this point I don't know um, I doubt uh, I doubt that a vendor like this would not be responsive uh, to uh, the district's direction. Um, we know that Youth Truth is also, it starts in like the third grade, and that there are uh, several schools uh, who have piloted their own Youth Truth-ish uh, age-appropriate questions for K through two, uh, and there's certainly, it certainly builds a sense for me that uh, that kind of conversation can continue to happen and uh, um, continue to include those who have a concern. Yeah. Based on what I see here, it's really about who's being surveyed, how much the unit price is per those surveys, and what the additional topics are, which are around emotional and mental health, school safety, and inclusion. It doesn't say anything about which questions we're going to ask. And so I'm sure that uh, Tilly Meyer and her team can probably work with the folks at Youth Truth. Um, and we can always revisit later on all of the questions and take a, take a peek at them. Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll uh, go ahead and take a vote on approving the agreement between Evergreen Public Schools and Center for 
effective philanthropy, youth truth, read the student and family survey school year, uh, the upcoming school year in the, uh, uh, in the, in the subsequent two years, uh, the three years total. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Abstain. We have four in favor with one abstention and the motion carries. The next item is uh, item K, resolution number 6949, uh, WIAA a, schools approved for membership. Um, is there a motion? I move to approve item number K off of the superintendent's consent agenda for the WIAA resolution. Second. It's been moved and seconded, Cronwald and Bocanegra. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I, I was gonna bring up um, the Washington Interscholastic Activities Association, WIAA, um, allows biological males to compete against biological girls. Um, they do not require biological male high school athletes to take part in hormone treatments to play and compete in biological girl sports. And I, this creates an unfair and unsafe playing field. Um, six weeks ago, a biological male won the Washington State WIAA girls 400 meter dash. Uh, this agreement with WIAA under the current rules puts Evergreen School District's girls at a physical disadvantage and in potential physical damage, uh, danger. Excuse me. I don't know the answer. However, the Kennewick School Board signed a resolution affirming that biological males should not participate in biological female sports. Um, we're running biological women out of women's sports when we allow biological males to compete against them. So again, I don't have all the answers, but I have a concern there, so. Thank you, Gary. Any other comments? So it looks from, uh, it, it, it looks from the resolution form that they sent that uh, the president and superintendent must sign this resolution form to indicate that the school board has approved the public school district's uh, membership with WIAA. And as members, these schools will follow the rules and regulations. Um, in the absence of that, what happens to sports? We don't play in the league. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. And our kids so, won't get opportunities to participate. So this seems like uh, something that we really should approve. Um, my, uh, I guess my second question is, I thought it was a matter of law uh, with gender expression and so forth, and as interpreted by OSPI and, uh, and some other state agencies, um, that we don't have control over that part. Th that is correct. Okay. Um, and based on that, we should approve this. There are opportunities for school board directors to have voice in WIAA, so that might be something, Gary, that you might want to pursue. Okay. Appreciate that. Any other comments? Nothing, Jean? No. Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm abstaining again. Okay. Four in favor, one abstention, and the motion carries. That was a long agenda item. Uh, just like 20, 20 things to approve. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, a superintendent report, Dr. Maloney. All right, well, thank you. I am uh, thrilled to be here. And it's a short report because I've only been here a very short time, but I've managed to pack in a lot of things in the few days I've been here so far. Uh, yesterday, I went with Veronica, uh, I'm gonna, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, M Magalenas? Magallanes. Pardon? Magallanes. Very on. Magallanes. Mag uh, I'm, we'll, 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 we're we'll gonna figure practice. It out. We will practice, I will get that correct. Director of Multilingual Learners. And so um, she and I connected in the morning and I was able to go over and visit summer school 
for our multi-language learners and walk in the classrooms, visit with staff, see students, talk with them. I was um, thrilled um, to see all the, the happy faces and the learning that was taking uh, place over there. And I did hit it during, I think that's the one I hit during lunchtime. I managed to hit a couple of the schools during lunch and breakfast time. It was great timing for me. Um, and then I was walking down the hallway and uh, I ran into Matt Bennett. And I talked to him for a little bit and invited myself to come see ESY. And so this morning I visited, um, I think we hit every single classroom, teachers, paras, and said hello, talked with students, met Greg the Sloth, uh, that was a little stuffed animal that one of our students had over there, and um, had a great time. So I really enjoyed getting to know people and learning people's names and chatting with them for a little while. So that was exciting to see. Tomorrow I'm gonna go see Archway, got some other things lined up as well. So, uh, um, Lori has been great helping me schedule meeting times with lots of different people from around the district, and we're starting to schedule different things. I am looking forward to meeting and learning um, about everyone and the district and so that we can move forward together. So it's been busy, and it will continue to be busy, but it's great work. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maloney. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is a presentation by our... Uh, Chief Financial Officer, Jennifer Jacobson, about the 2025 levy. <laughs> welcome. All right, good evening to the board and a special welcome to our new interim superintendent, Dr. Maloney. We're super excited to have you here, so uh, welcome. Um, I am just going to present some levy information today. I know uh, this is a ways down the road, but I thought it's a good idea to just go over some information and facts and, and, um, and share that at this point to start us thinking about it. Um, both our educational programs and operations levy and our tech levy are both set to expire in 2025. So that means we need to go out in 2025 in order to set up collections for 2026. Um, I, in my timeline here, I um, assumed we would go out in February, uh, but that, of course, is a board decision. You can go out in February, April, August, and November are the four options. Uh, most districts go out in February because it is the least costliest time to go out because we're uh, sharing the ballot with a lot of other government agencies and candidates, and so it lowers our cost of the distribution of the ballots in that. So, um, and uh, another fact is that we can only run the levy twice, so we need to keep that in mind as well. So, uh, so starting off just with some basic levy facts, because again, we don't look at this for, you know, every three years, um, so that it's helpful to just kind of remember these uh, basic facts. So levies are approved for a duration of one to six years. Um, in the past, we've passed our educational programs and operations levies for three-year time period, but recently, uh, both Canvas and Vancouver passed four-year levies. So because it is so costly to run the levy, that is something to take into account, the length and duration of the levies. Um, the levies require a simple majority of 50% to pass, unlike running bonds that take the super majority of 60%. Uh, the educational programs and operations levy, the, that's our, our main levy. It's also called an enrichment levy. It's supposed to supplement kind of what the basic ed funding is for our district. Um, and that's just deposited into our general fund to support operations. Uh, in the old days, it was called maintenance and operations levy, MNO, and um, it's also called a replacement levy. So lots of names. Uh, capital projects fund levy, uh, we have run a tech levy in the past and just primarily focused that levy around uh, getting devices one-to-ones for all of our students, uh, for our staff. Um, it, it helps fund our, our hardware specialists and, and all kinds of technology. Um, you also have the option to expand that levy to also support our security systems you want to install at the district and also capital renewal projects. So that's something uh, Camus has done recently. They expanded their tech levy to also include some other items um, and it, it gives you a little more flexibility. So the board has to determine the duration of these levies and the total amount to be collected per year. 
So the tax rate is just an estimate. It's based on what we think projected assessed value is going to be. Um, what you're really approving is the total amount to be collected for each year. So just some historical levy information. In 2019, uh, it was before I was here, but um, we ran two levies. One was a three-year EPNO levy, and we also ran a six-year tech levy at that time. And we passed them both with about 51.6% approval. Um, so that tech levy was over six years. We didn't have to rerun it. Um, it's just coming up expiring next year. Uh, in 2022, we needed to replace our three-year EPNO levy that had expired. Uh, we ran that in February, and that was uh, failed at a 42.8% rate. We uh, decided to lower the amounts we were asking for, and we came back in April that year and passed with a 54.4% rate. Um, just to give you an example, uh, the cost of running the February EPNO levy that year was $118,000. When we came back in April, we were the only ones on the ballot. We had to cover $172,000 to run that levy. So it was quite a bit more expensive to run that second levy. Um, so I just have listed here the amounts we've collected or are collecting for these three years. Uh, keep in mind, there is a levy lid just on the EP&O levy part, uh, a maximum collection amount set by the state. So both, uh, there's a maximum per pupil amount. Uh, for 2024, it's 3150 per pupil, and Evergreen's at 2031 currently this year. Uh, we also can't collect more than a $2.50 per $1,000 assessed value. So we're at $1.59 in the current year. So there's, we're quite far below the maximum level that we can collect. Um, I've included this OSPI report. I like including OSPI reports because anyone can go out. If you want to see the full report and see all the districts in the state, you can go out on the website and find this, this report. Um, it shows, I, I sorted by just the regional districts to show what our levy per student collection amount is compared to these other districts in our region. So we are the second lowest uh, levy per student amount. Um, I should point out that uh, OSPI used the greater of 1920 or 2122 FTE students because during COVID we saw such fluctuations in enrollment and so OSPI started using that instead of just a flat uh, student number. When I did do the calculation with our current student enrollment, it, it bumped it up a little bit because our enrollment has continued to drop. Um, but it's still, we were about $1,900, and so we're still in that second, second place for uh, the lowest. Oh, I should also mention, um, so we do have a tech levy in addition to our EPNO levy. Uh, so do Vancouver, Camas, Washougal, um, and then Battleground just passed a tech levy as well. So the other school districts only have the EPNO levy and do not have a supplemental tech levy to help with those tech expenses. Um, I wanted to pull out Camus and VPS. These are our two neighbors. We're often used with comparisons with Camus and VPS and show both the EPNO levy per student and then that capital levy and where we fall. And you can see over these three years, Evergreen is significantly lower than both Camus and VPS in our collections per student. Um, our capital levy was a little bit higher than Vancouver's, but our EPNO levy continues to be significantly lower than what they are currently collecting. Am I going too fast or? Okay. You're fine. Uh, so here is historical levy information. Um, you can see how our assessed value has really gone through the roof in the last few years. We were at 19 billion in our region in 2020. And uh, we currently are at $28.5 billion in this region. So you can see the percent increased in our assessed value here. Uh, we had 17.5%, 6.7%, some huge numbers. And uh, so we kind of have to forecast where that's going to be in the future. Um, right now, financial advisors are using 4%. Uh, I did get some preliminary information for 2025, and I think it, it's likely going to be even lower than that. So that is something, as we're working through the process, we can kind of keep in mind um, 
So you can see the total amount of bond collections and then the tech levy and EPNO levy amounts we've collected over the last few years and those are the amounts we will set. Um, our bond rate is, is going down and so part of our strategy is whether we want to keep consistent rates, keep our total tax rate at a certain amount, um, how we want to structure this. So back in 2022, we were at 379. We promised the voters it would stay under 379 and we have kept it at 357 for the last three years in a row. So, so some considerations as we're moving forward, um, whether we want to maintain running two separate levies, uh, the EPNO levy and the tech uh, capital projects fund levy, or whether we want to combine it into just one levy. If we think we have a better shot at passing one levy versus two, um, there's all of those considerations to take into account. Uh, one thing to, to think about though is if we were to combine those two, um, we would start seeing that levy lid, we would start climbing up to it. And that might be a limiting factor in our total collections. Um, we also have more flexibility with that capital projects fund levy. As our bond projects are finishing up, it would be helpful to have some capital renewal um, you know, supported by having this additional capital projects fund levy. Um, and then there's always some risk of running the two levies versus one. And so I have uh, some information I can share at a later date when we're in a board work session that DA Davidson put together about what the percentages are if you're running you know, one levy versus two, if it helps to run them together or uh, which it does. I think if you ran a capital projects levy on its own right now, it's, it has an 82% chance of passing, but if you run it with an EPNO levy, it's I think 89% chance of passing. So um, it does appear to be helpful to run the two together. Uh, another consideration is determining the duration of the levy. If you want to continue with the three-year levy, um, if we want to do the tech levy at six years like we have in the past, uh, that's another consideration. And then of course, the amounts of the levy. So lastly, uh, the timeline. So now I'm just sharing information so that you can start thinking about this. Um, in August or September, we'll have a workshop so we can kind of discuss more options and, and different amounts and types of levies. Um, and then in October, November, we'll need to pass a levy resolution to uh, approve the amount uh, we'd like to collect. And in November, I will submit a pre-ballot approval form to OSPI. And then our filing deadline with the county is December 13th. Um, and that is all for the February 11th election day. So that's kind of working backwards from that day. Um, and that's uh, really all I had to share. So do you have any questions or it's a lot of information? <laughs> Well, I know um, what, February of 2022, the levy failed by a little over 3,600 votes, and then April of 2022, it passed by over 2,700 votes. So there's a 6,400 vote almost swing there. And realizing, you know, with the bitter teacher strike and, you know, the recent vote of no confidence from the teachers union, it, it's going to make it challenging this time around uh, for those reasons. And added on to that, I didn't think of this back last in March when we were going through the budget, but um, you know, eliminating all the elementary librarians, that's gonna be another um, hard hurdle, I think, for getting, uh, and I know we were back then, Rob, you said we were at step N in March on the budget process. And at this point, I'm sure we're probably Step X, probably, because the sec first reading's next, probably our next yep. board meeting. Yep, and the board then, is due to the ESD 112 tomorrow, and then we'll go through that with them. Sometimes we have revisions to make. Um, it'll be publicly available the next week, um, and then at the next board meeting, I'll present. Yeah, the, the first budget, reading, so. and then second reading, the last yes. board meeting in August. So. Yep. Um, I don't know if there's any way to adjust anything with the budget there for elementary librarians, but I know I, I'm afraid it could be a, a stumbling point. So just in reality. Uh, it's five weeks away. The first reading is the August 13th meeting. So there's 
just a lot of time. Julie, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple things about the levy and um, to Gary's point about the uh, February failure to the April. I don't think we did a, a lot of um, work and communication around that first one where, where we should have been out telling our story, um, talking to our community about the importance of the levy. And I think that we have learned um, from that experience that we need to have the information early. That's why Jennifer's presenting to us tonight so we can start thinking about or what we need to do. Um, I also think that, you know, as we consider our levy proposals and the timelines and do we combine them, we have to think about, and I think this board has always made a priority to try to keep the tax levy rate down. And um, I think that's important to us. That's, I think we knew that coming into the year where the bond rate went lower, that we would be in a good place. And so we could show our citizens that we're being responsible and not trying to raise taxes. Um, so we have a lot of education to do and a lot of communicate, a lot of communicating, and I think it's really important that we're starting now and that we're getting the information so we can start thinking about how we want to um, put this on the ballot when we decide to do it, and then um, how we move forward in our efforts from there. Thank you. Um, a, uh, a lot of questions, and this goes back to years and years before I was on the board, uh, have to do with. Uh, people would ask me, what do you do with the money? Uh, and the answer, uh, it's deposited into the general fund, is not always uh, terribly satisfactory, but I did want to make sure and confirm with you that EPNO levy dollars are deposited into the local sub fund, uh, and that the reporting uh, can show the spending out of the local sub fund as disaggregated from the spending out of the rest of the general fund. That's correct. Okay. They, they changed that accounting about four years ago. Yeah, it came with uh, specifically came with the McCleary fix or the legislation before that, right? Yeah. Um, I think it'll be important to talk about now that we have four years of, of data about how the money was spent. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be important to talk about that in those terms, and and uh, I'm certainly willing to help with the data stuff. And we have a plan put in place that identifies exactly how the levy funds are, are spent out. So that's a requirement by OSPI now. So yeah. that's audited every year, and they Excellent. make sure we follow it. Excellent. Yeah, right. I would um, definitely get that communicated to the public, because I know on the budget survey there were a number of comments stating about, um, you know, you, we worked to pass the levy, and the dollars that were supposed to go to things are being cut from those levy dollars so um and i think there were a few comments like that actually on the superintendent search um survey um so i think the community needs to be better communicated with as far as you know where these levy dollars are going and here's where these levy dollars in the past where they were gonna go and here's where they went and because yeah, there maybe is some miscommunication there maybe i don't know um, I'm just going from what people answer in the survey. So. It's uh, around 13.5% of the total budget, uh, at least the 2025 projections. Contradict me if I'm wrong about that, but it's a big deal. If you combine tech levy and... Oh, oh it's you know. 447.8 over 400 million. Is, is, it's a big deal, and the loss of that source of fund funding is... Uh, going to make the last three years of budget cuts look easy. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of talking to do and a, a lot of persuading and a lot of information sharing. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Thanks. The next three items are information items for the board. The first one is the financial statement uh, for May 2024. Are there any comments or questions from the board about uh, this item? I had asked uh, questions and Jennifer uh, answered them. Okay. Um, hearing no comments, uh, the second item is the, uh, oh, no action is required on information item A. Um, the second item is the Clean Building Performance Standard Qualified Assistant and Investment Grade Audit Phase 1. Um, is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, no, no further action is required. The third one is the school bus fleet electrification plan. Um, is there any discussion? Yeah, I'm gonna write down, jot down a few things. Um, okay. You know, it, it says in there that it's in line with the state's decarbonization goals. Um, this is this has already been approved. Is that my understanding? Because I, I didn't know if we were approving this. It's a $134 or $134,000 feasibility study for. Um, I think it was Senate Bill 5431 that's under consideration that effective, if it passes, which we don't know if it will or not, but it would, starting in 2035, so over 10 years from now, we would, every bus that we purchase would have to be in electronic uh, EV. And I'll, I'll let you go from here, Nicole. <laughs> so. <laughs> and uh, Bob, if you have any Welcome, Nicole. No, I just, I just wanted to say that my information was that the board approved the spending last August uh, on the August 18th meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about, um, I, we had a discussion, you and I, yes. and, uh, and talked about it, but there was a law that did pass regarding electrification of the fleet. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and, uh, for sure. So the second substitute House Bill 1368 did pass. Um, that went into effect June 6, 2024. Uh, the school district did make comment during legislative session about that particular bill. Um, there were portions of it that were not well defined. Um, and the school district is absolutely interested in being an environmental steward, but it has to make sense. One of the biggest portions of that particular bill was that it did not consider the total cost of ownership. So while it may be simple to change out an existing school bus for an electric school bus at its regular depreciation schedule, what's not being considered is the total cost of the infrastructure. I mean, we have to pay for those stations. Well, when you dive into that, you're looking at what's the electrical load existing at transportation. Do we have enough? We have almost 300 school buses in our fleet. That's just our school buses. We also have a white fleet to consider. And then eventually, I mean, this will expand potentially, right, in the state to our maintenance vehicles, our mowers. I mean, it, it can go well beyond that. So we really needed to get an idea of what is that total cost of ownership? How do we train our maintenance, our mechanics to, uh, to actually maintain these school buses? So that House bill was revised to basically pare it down and investigate that total cost of ownership. They put that task on OSPI in coordination with the Department of Ecology. And so I believe per that House bill, I believe starting or by November, um, they should be surveying school districts around the state to get an idea of um, the impact, the total cost of ownership, the current, so current emission, zero emission vehicles that school districts have, um, if they're going to be seeking grant funding, how much are they looking at? Are they looking at it just for infrastructure, infrastructure and the buses, et cetera? Um, and then looking at the depreciation schedules and if they have anything in existence in their fleets that was manufactured prior to 2007, why do they still have it? Um, and then they're supposed to then take that, wrap that up pretty little bow and send that back to the legislature so they understand then the funding piece. In the meantime though, because, so there was that bill and then there was the Senate Bill 5431 which is kind of just sitting right now. Yes. Yeah, so because once again, we need to understand how much is this gonna actually be for school districts. Um, there are currently grant funds through the state and federal grant funds as well for school districts. Um, obviously the federal stuff is every school district in the United States of America. Um, and of course you can utilize, I believe you can utilize say, some of the state funds as matching for that and there's ways to make it happen but realistically at this time, our school district doesn't even understand what it would take to even get to the point to outfit 300 school buses as zero emission vehicles. So all of that to say, <laughs> 
This particular study is just that starting point. In addition to that, working very closely with Yvonne and Lindell in transportation, there was a lot of discomfort with even taking a step forward to try it out. We have neighboring school districts that have small, small portions, like six school buses, et cetera. Folks are starting out small, A, because it's very expensive, and B, the technology, as we know, it's changing rapidly. Now I feel there have been, um, the EPA is doing a lot of webinars and stuff, and I mean, they are feeling a lot more confident about pushing stuff out to school districts and helping them understand how this will work. This particular study will look at implementing EV buses, two small buses and two large buses for us, so we can get an idea of what's that like. Is it sustainable for us, um, given our routes, given athletics, given all kinds of other things we need to consider? The cold weather, that needs to be considered as well. And then it will then create a whole plan, a basically a long-term plan that will tell us, by this point we could do Within 10 years, we could outfit another 100, given the existing electrical load we have. But if we wanna go beyond that, we need to invest in a larger transformer at transportation. We then take that information to share that with Clark PUD, and they will then get an understanding, not just our district, but they really need to know about all the districts in Clark County, how much is it going to actually take on the grid to make this happen? are there larger term investments that they need to do to make sure that there's enough electrical load to make this occur? So this plan, this study will help support that, but it's not a deep dive into it because we're, we wanna be confident before we step forward and kind of joining in on this journey with other school districts. Yeah, because it's a big step. Yeah, and you know, even logistics, you know, right now, you takes maybe 10 minutes to fill the school bus up right. and it's going to take hours possibly and you'd have to have all those you know if you get a fleet of 300 for sure and that's the beauty of kind of entering in now so i'll go to my previous school district because i was there when we did the, <laughs> when we did the electric buses there and we didn't put in the right charging stations um, we would be looking at level twos and those bad boys will charge up in like 10 minutes so, I mean, so that's what I mean, and, that, and that's a consideration, right? I mean, how many, and, and that's what this study will help with, how many school buses need to be charged up in the 10 minutes versus, you know what, we can still, these buses, we use them for maybe shorter term trips, we don't use them that often, maybe it's for field trips, athletic, whatever the case may be, they can go on a charger where it does take a, a longer period of time to charge, oh. so. This bill, 1368, it's passed. And the backup in the, that uh, attachment talked about the 5431, and it hadn't passed. It was under consideration. Right. But there is, it, I don't think it mentioned 1368, but 1368 did pass. It did pass, um, and it, that passed the House March 5th, passed the Senate March 1st, approved March 28th, um, signed March, or filed and signed by the governor March 29th, and went into effect June 6th. Um, the reason, so because the Senate bill is more of the crux of after this happens with OSPI, this is how it's going to go. Once they know that total cost of ownership and they develop basically the funding for that, because that's really what needs to happen, because we're not the only school district vying for the monies, right? Hopefully it's not another unfunded state mandate on Hopefully. education. So. Precisely why we testified, because we have between this and the clean building performance standard, you're talking about compliance, things that are, once again, we wanna be good stewards of the environment. What is the cost of that? Because if we get, like you said, if we have unfunded mandates, it's very difficult on school districts. And I mean, we're a larger school district. I mean, the, the, rural, the rural school districts, they struggle with this. Um, and so it's, and trust me, I talk with my facility counterparts all around the state and we're all like, how do we make this happen? How do we, we wanna do this, but where's that money coming from?
Yeah, and then the life of the batteries and then what to do with these giant batteries when they're... Your percent? Yeah, the EV or the, you know, ecological, you know, how to dispose of them is, mm -hmm. is a question too, so... Yeah, absolutely. It's a full life cycle, not just for that particular industry, but I mean, when you think about it for school districts too, that's like I said, that total cost of ownership, that whole study that getting that information is going to be vital for us as we proceed. So 1368, is that similar requiring us to, as of 2035 to all purchase? No, it doesn't have anything. Not yet. Once they, once they do their study, then I think they will take the crux of that Senate bill mm -hmm. and really expand and create those new deadlines for school districts. And it will follow, I mean, logically, it's gonna follow the regular depreciation of the school buses that's already in existence, but it's just a matter of developing that schedule and seeing what will actually work and be sustainable for school districts long-term. Yeah, and for electrical grids. You know. Absolutely. Thanks. You're so welcome. Any other questions? Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, no action is required on this item. And that's the third of the three information items. The next item on the agenda is board comments. Comments by uh, the school board. Who would like to start? I don't have anything. Okay. Once again, uh, Superintendent Maloney, welcome. Uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, and. Uh, and I'm glad to have someone in the seat. <laughs> Essentially, it's uh, not possible to effectively lead without our superintendent. And I'm hoping that you're uh, having a good onboarding experience and, and just want you to know that if you need anything from me, uh, please just reach out. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Um, yeah, welcome, Christine. And... Um, yeah, the, back in May, um, I had mentioned it, and actually Jackie was the first one to bring it up about uh, looking at a possible cell phone policy um, after we got that book from Kerry McGarry and The Anxious Generation. And um, I brought it up in June, so I, is there any possibility of having that be on maybe the next board meeting to have a discussion on? Well, we have some uh, retreat dates coming up. Uh, you should uh, get your availability on uh, the days and weekends or evenings uh, so that we can schedule those workshops in August. Um, and uh, I agree. Um, we should have, begin having conversation about that. I would agree. I would agree as well about having the conversations. I would maybe, because um, I'm having a conversation about the fact that we want it is we all kind of know we need it, mm -hmm. um, but maybe when we do discuss it, maybe having some content to that, checking with other school districts to see what maybe they're doing so that we have some depth to the conversation. Yeah, I know Evergreen presented last month. Evergreen High School? Yeah. yeah. That they had done an over 90% vote and had submitted it earlier that day to admin, so I'm, I don't know where that's at or my understanding when we had the SIP um, with Evergreen, because Evergreen's in my student school improvement plan presentations, is that they did not have full buy-in and they were worried that if not all of the teachers do it, that the kids will get to that point where they're like, oh, we don't really care what some of them are doing. So it's definitely something we need to discuss and look, because I don't want it to be just another rule that's handed down that is just ignored and frustrates people. I'd like to be more intentional with it. I think it's a much larger topic too. I, I, I'm interested in having the conversation as well, but I think that there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, I think that you need to, there was a comment earlier about families want it. Well, I'm not sure all families want it. I, I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think families like having their student having access to their phone during the day as well. So I think there's a lot of questions that we need to answer. Um, I also think that there's, you know, we see and hear about all of these classrooms that have storage cases and you walk in and you put your phone and then I'm like, well, we have a lot of classrooms. So I don't know what the expense would be like on that. So there's a lot of things to consider. So I don't know it's something that 
I definitely think we need to have the conversation about it and, and start that dialogue, but I don't know if it's something that we can decide this summer. I don't know if that's even possible. Okay. Um, definitely one for the workshop. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to mention too, Initiative 2081, um, the Parents' Rights, or the Parents' Bill of Rights, um, it received 455,000 signatures. I know I submitted over 200 myself, and it was signed into law in March, and it um, received bipartisan support, passing in the House of Representatives by a vote of 82 to 15, and passing in the State Senate unanimously, 49 to nothing. Mm -hmm. And on June 5th, uh, Chris Reichdahl, our Superintendent of Public Instruction, instructed school districts not to change policies affected by the new law, um, doesn't seem to be at this time supporting it. Um, so if you're a parent and you care about parental rights, you can email him. <laughs> Thank you. It, do you happen to hear why? Or just as? It, I know there was a injunction, but it had been denied. There was an injunction at the time. But. From OSPI? No, um, some groups. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Maybe one. Well, my sense of that was that uh, that uh, most of the legislature, um, most of the House, and all of the Senate were satisfied that it wouldn't uh, create a conflict with other law. Many of the things listed in the Parents' Bill of Rights initiative were already rights. Um, but I think a lot of school districts in the state itself had problems uh, with the enumeration uh, and explanation of those things because each of those rights were defined and scattered uh, throughout case law and so forth. Um, I never anticipate that it would change uh, how we should interact with parents when they have concerns, but um, and so I don't anticipate a you know a big. That, it, that it'll become a big deal. Um, if it does, we'll talk about it. Are there any other comments? Hearing none, we'll call this meeting to recess and then reconvene uh, for a board workshop after the board signs some papers. With that, we're in recess. Mm -hmm.